before we get into the history of the brand, can you just talk about your role and your your, your day to day running of the place? Well, basically, I guess we, Todd and I worked side by side with my dad for about you know thirty years. I would guess is about right. Like he start he came to this country in nineteen forty seven, and his first job in America as a Holocaust survivor was he had a friend working in the old 3G factory here in Brooklyn. And so he started off kind of as a job that he thought would be like part-time job so he could like go to school at night, learn English and get set up in America for whatever he was gonna actually do as a career. And from carrying bundles from place to place, he gradually, you know, wanted to know about everything happening in the shop and, and advanced. And 30 years later, he was running the factory and all the manufacturing and quality control and production. And he was able to then buy uh, in 1977 from the Goldman brothers. That's when it became Martin Greenfield Clothiers. And I joined him right out of school, out of dental school in about 1981. And, you know, he, his forte was in clothing making, not so much in business. And mine was just a student. Uh, I would be like his sounding board as he was making decisions and, you know, buying the business, trying to run it. It started off a little tough at the time in the seventies. It was a very bad environment for business. All his customers that he was working with were having financial troubles, the interest rates were like 22%. They couldn't get paid and ran into difficulties and kind of like had to rethink like the structure of the business. And about that time is when I came in and kind of like, you know, worked side by side to like, we developed a lot of private label business where we would work for other brands and designers and manufacture clothing for them. And they would then distribute it to the retailers. Uh, we would also work directly with different stores and create, you know, lines just specifically for them. So we were very skilled at hand tailored clothing. And, you know, we developed, or I, I helped develop a computer system at the time where, you know, we could do pattern work on computer where we could modify and change much more quickly than the standard to make new models, new patterns, but all with the idea that they could be constructed in the same way through our hand tailored operations in the shop. So that's how we were able to be, to do like a band of outsiders model, a rag and bone model, uh, a model for Neiman Marcus, a Brooks brothers model for them. So we were able to make many different patterns and always like going back through three G's. One of the specialties of our company was, you know, to make custom clothing for individual patterns off of different styles and models all the time. It was always a large percentage of the production. So again, we worked with many custom, you know, from a Paul Stewart or an Alan Flusser or, mm -hmm. you know, custom shirt shop or custom for Brooks Brothers or, you know, so we were very involved in, you know, working with tailors and sales associates in different locations, how to sell and measure and fit people in custom clothing. And then to some extent, we reserve that for only friends and family here, like on Saturday mornings. And so, and we would try not to sell directly to the consumer because of our relationships with the retailer over the years. But, you know, most of these retailers, like they really work for themselves is a sad thing to say, but, you know, there's a large markup when you sell something to a retailer and by the end, like they get pressured for lower prices and, you know, ready to wear goods tend to get made in cheaper and cheaper places to enable better margins. So we kind of focus more recently on, you know, dealing with the consumer and making clothing, you know, for a person that we can measure ourselves or with some custom makers that, you know, could work within our systems as well. So that's really been our focus. Like our skill is how to measure a person and make them, you know, it didn't matter. Like a lot of custom makers have like one look or one pattern or one style that they make. And then they have to make that 
fit a certain person. So they don't have the flexibility we were used to. It didn't matter if it was Brooks Brothers, Rag and Bone, you know, or 20 other things. We could make different patterns to fit the same person if necessary. And then as we started working more and more, like to measure an actor to us is the same as measuring any of our customers, which we do, you know, every day of the week now. And, you know, again, like who is the person as opposed to what is the actor playing? So, you know, sometimes we measure the same actor and he's in two different shows or movies. He's mm -hmm. a different person in a different environment with a different in a different time even so we're able to you know focus on the individual needs aside from just measuring a person and making them clothing you know we have the ability to to make the right clothing for the right person that even involves their personality which you know we we learned a lot of that from working on many of these shows um so jay before we get into the costuming aspect i'm just curious about mm -hmm. um a little more on the day to day. So, do you guys not use paper patterns then? Is it like you measure and then you go to the computer? No, so, we have, so early on, we enabled the computer because, you know, when we first started, we would use all paper patterns. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the cutter would lay out a cloth on the cutting table, pick out the closest size stock pattern, and, you know, then following the custom order, the length, the alterations, right low, he stands erect, lower the button mm -hmm. stand. You know, he would do all those alterations on the table and create that garment. You know, when I looked at it, you know, it, it was good, but like, what if you wanted the same suit six months later? Or what if you gave it to a different cutter to cut? Each one had, you know, similar ways of, of getting there. And when I got involved with like, a custom design, you know, computerized, you know, cutting system, pattern system. So I, I delved into how do we make a, a right shoulder low? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was surprised that I got, I expected one answer, but I got many answers. Well, what if it's a plaid? What if it's not a plaid? There's different ways to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a simple thing like, oh, you're going to make the jacket shorter. So what do you do to the waistline of the jacket in shortening a jacket? So, and the answer is proportionally, you want to raise, if you shorten the jacket length, you want to raise the button stand and the pockets and the waistline of the coat proportionally. So maybe if you're making a jacket one inch difference, you might go a half inch difference at the waist. And that would be like a standard grade that like, our custom designers knew of. Mm -hmm. So by using the computer, we could design the alteration. And I would say, well, what happens when you shorten it just a quarter of an inch? Do you do you move the waistline an eighth of an inch then? And, and the cutters would say, no, because no one could see an eighth of an inch. Mm -hmm. But once the computer was designed to do the alteration the way we wanted, I found that it could do perfect alterations all the time because it doesn't care if it makes, you know, three more movements, even if they're down to a 32nd of an inch. So I really spent my early years, like, really getting to understand every possible alteration to patterns for the use of fitting. Mm -hmm. and, to and we built this proprietary system so that, you know, when we measure somebody and we say right low a half an inch, like we know exactly how we're going to do that and it's consistent and it's done with a computer manipulation. It's, it started with a paper pattern, but you know, the advantage of the computer is that we can replicate that pattern exactly if he wants a second suit or we could instill alterations into that. So whatever we do at a fitting, we can modify that pattern so then we can achieve we can achieve better results and we lock in all those patterns. So, and each one has its own pattern. We can print it out. So it's no different than a paper pattern, except if, when someone has a paper pattern for a person and you want to make a change, you can't really add to it. Like it's very difficult to change that pattern in an appreciable way. We could jump from the one pattern to from a single breasted to a double breasted. It makes no difference because we're applying the same alterations. So again, we could have a pattern for a person, 
but it's really specific to a style pattern. Mm -hmm. So that person could have pleated pants or he could have flat front pants or he could have a very tapered pant, but he still, his body measurements don't really change. Oh, that's cool. It's very okay. clever. It takes all the guesswork out. Got, we, we hate guesswork. <laughs> Jay, I've got to ask, is, yes. is your dad on board with the technology? Like, I'm just well, imagining yeah. myself in your shoes talk, and having this conversation with my dad, who was, he thought computers were going to end the world like Skynet. So I, well, I thought, well, how, how does that relationship work? So that relation is a little tricky, but, you know, on one end, my dad still to this day has never used a computer, just to give you a... So that part was that. But, you know, as far as the use of technology in making clothing, like his expertise was on production and quality. So he was always at the front line of like, oh, everybody was trying to mechanize every clothing operation through the years. But he would see something and say, okay, if this machine can do this job that makes this garment better than what it is today, then I can look at it. But just to make something faster and cheaper, which is what most of the technology is focused on, like, and usually to do it faster and cheaper, you eliminate a lot of the flexibility and capability. So it's a more, if a machine is going to sew something that a person used to, typically it does it in a very specific controlled way. And then you can't go left or right. You can't go, you know, this fabric or that fabric. So it eliminates your capability and it's only for speed and, you know, profit. And so that was never acceptable to him, but he was always open to something that could do something better. And we found that having the patterns on computer were way better than we could do by hand. So mm -hmm. we still make the entire garment by hand, but, you know, here, you know, we, we are to the 32nd of an inch. We can replicate it. We have a record of everything we do. Uh, and so it definitely improved our quality of suit. Hmm. And what, how many suits can you turn out in a given day or week? Um, so it's changed over the years, but I would say about a hundred is about what, what our setup is right now, oh, wow. you know, and it depends on the workforce and the need at the time, but pretty oh, much wow. that. Sorry, 100 in a, in a single day, you mean? In a week. Oh, in a week. Okay. Oh, that makes more sense. <laughs> of custom garments. Yes. Right, right. Gotcha. So are you and your brother, Todd, are you also cutters? Did you take, take on that skill from your dad at all? No. So we're not, like, I'd say my skill is fabric. It's style, fit, measurement, pattern manipulation, uh, quality. Uh, just knowledge of, you know, what's the difference between clothing from the 1900s through today. Like I've had the luck of being able to work over the years with many of like the top clothing designers and costume designers. And, you know, you learn so much each time from people who do it so much and their viewpoints. But we were able to, you know, incorporate that into what we do and how we do it. My brother's skill coming in, like, I kind of fished my brother out like it took me a year or so after I was here. So my brother is about how things tick. He like understands the nuts and bolts of, you know, minutia that nobody really could understand. So tailoring at that time, we were young. We come into a clothing business and, you know, if you ask a tailor, like you see, he's sewing a certain kind of stitch in an armhole and you ask, you know, well, why do you do this this way? And his answer is always, well, this is because this is what I was taught. Like he could show you what he does, but nobody could really explain why they do what they do. My brother could look at it and say, well, look, he's making these loose, flexible stitches around the armhole. And that arm, that sleeve is actually by those stitches. It's able to move and shift when the person moves. So that's why you're using that kind of stitch there. And what's the kind of thread it has to be with and like what's the you know there's a bridle on the lapel and you know it's made so that it has no give to it it's not on a bias and you know each step by step todd was able to dissect like the 108 operations in the making of a jacket and he could really understand 
what we were doing, what other people were doing, even they could be working for 20 years, but, you know, he could actually explain it to someone else and, and focus on how it works and how, why it works. And, you know, in today's world, you know, it used to be any component you needed for a tailored garment, you pick up the phone and an hour later, they would deliver it at your doorstep here in Brooklyn. Uh, now there's very little clothing made in the whole country here. Mm-hmm. And ingredients many times, like you go to order something or we need something, it may be in China today, it may be in Germany, it may be in Italy. Uh, he's able to go search the world and find you know, the right ingredients for based on the needs, even if we have to be inventive or industrious about you know the flexibility of how to do without sacrificing the quality of the garment Mm -hmm. so my brother's involved very much in the making of the suits and i'm more involved in the designing fitting and selling of the suits okay interesting and so i'm i'm wanting to touch on films and tv and just going through the timeline of the family and, and the brand, when did the, the TV companies and the film and the costume designers start knocking on your door? Well, it probably knocked for a long time. So back in the days of 3G clothes, like they were very involved in movies and television and, you know, but it was through other retailers. Mm-hmm. So they would be the supplier. So if it was in Hollywood, like there were stores in California that we dealt with, and it would really be through the store that all this would happen. And so, and then my father personally, he did not like the idea of working on movie or show clothing. He felt like it was always a rush and he didn't like the rush. He says rushing is not good for quality. Rushing is disruptive. Like he would always resisted it unless it was like a really, you know, say like Wall Street, the movie, like that was one way back. Like it took like Alan, it took like Alan Flusser to come to him and say, listen, we're working on this movie project and we really need your help to get this done. And, you know, then he would, you know, in that case, entertain it. But Mm -hmm. at some point, you know, I looked at it after that as an opportunity, like, I guess the first big show that came to us where it was going to involve a significant energy from us was uh, Boardwalk Empire. And the costume designer, John Dunn, came to meet with me and, you know, he was trying to describe what was going to be entailed in this project. And he said, you know, without you that could make the clothing, we we really don't have a chance to do this, but it's going to involve like every week, new scripts, new characters, and a lot of clothing. And we're going to have very little time to make each piece. And we're going to have to make many of these pieces. So, you know, we kind of had to figure out how to not disrupt our normal clothing, but yet, you know, we only have one production line. The person who is a sleeve sewer sews all the sleeves people who make the pockets make all the pockets it goes step by step in a consistent way but so I was able so to figure out okay I'm going to like measure every character so it's not going to take anybody's time but me I'm going to do all the fittings I'm going to write up all the orders so just a question of like as long as we're clear on like these are the garments we need this week then communicating with my brother my father you know going through the shop to really be on top of it, you know, we kind of made our own like movie line that would go through the shop. And, you know, also I came up with this, you know, breakthrough, like my father always resisted rushes. Rushes were always a favor for a customer who was having a problem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't like to, you know, we've always been, my father's, you know, attitude is support for the retailer and the seller. So he would always do whatever he physically could do to help. But with the shows, I said, you know, maybe if we're going to do things faster, we have a right to charge more accordingly. Like the quicker they need something, it should cost more than a suit that takes us normally six to eight weeks to make. So we kind of came up or I came up with this idea that, you know, 
the price was based on time. And if they would give us a normal amount of time to make a suit, it really could be the same price as a normal suit that we make because there's no difference. I measure a person, what they like, pick the right fabric, design it to fit them and the right style that they're looking for, and then do the fitting, the alteration, finish it, deliver it. There's really no difference. It's just you know, a 1920s suit as opposed to a rag and bone suit. It took the same effort to make a pattern that was something no one had ever seen before. We make a new pattern. We could use the computer system to digitize and grade it. So like in a boardwalk empire, we worked on, we made like three standard models of the time. There were some that were like more like elegant and like something that Nucky or you know, the or the politicians or, you know, diplomats would be wearing. We had another suit that was a little more like not as refined, more gangsterish, but still fitted. And, you know, but it was something like the New York gangsters was where. And then, you know, there were things that were more like guys on the street or an FBI guy would have less shape and design to it. And we kind of made like three boardwalk silhouettes as if they were new designs and then you know based on the character was he a b or c and then you know to the point where you know john could just send me a person and fabric and say just make it like this and from the measurements you know we could dress him up accordingly and <laughs> you know it's, it's we got to the point where to work together like that that's so cool. Like you were making clothes for Wall Street in like the late 80s, like through Alan Flusser and even the costume designer, Alan Mirage, didn't know that it was right. getting one of those suits. Um, but, it, you know, until you guys started working directly with the costume designers, like another 20 some years. That's, right. You know, yeah. So, you know, with John Dunn, then, you know, as we, it was more publicized of what we were doing, you know, one show, like also like our hesitation was we work with a store you know, the store has another season. There's not like it doesn't end. You make clothing for a movie. It's like, oh, now the movie's over. So that clothing is never going to be made here again. But, you know, we yeah. learn that. But those costume designers go on to the next movie and the next show. And, mm -hmm. you know, if they were if we created some great clothing together, then probably that becomes a forte of theirs. And the next show that they work on that needs clothing I think it becomes a natural that we get a call and, you know, this assistant goes that way and this one goes to this show. And, you know, before you know it, we're working on 20 shows at the same time. And are you still doing the measurements with the principal actors that have, or have so, you also kind of delegated a few? Well, out? Rich, Rich has been instrumental in helping with that as well. So, but, but that's basically between myself or Rich, that's about as far as we let it we like to have our hands on it so sometimes there's nothing you can do i mean like we've been flexible through covid say you know i had to measure robert duval for uh the movie hustle the hustle oh, yeah. yeah yeah you, you did. guys are <laughs> so they gave me a sketch Love of that jacket that jacket Beamed out of the telly when I was watching that movie. God damn, love so that. they gave us a sketch with his head superimposed on it of this 1970s Western style, you know, kind of suit with bell bottoms and all this stitching and details. But to measure him, like he was in Virginia at the time and it was COVID and we were in Brooklyn. So I had to figure out how to measure him over Zoom. And I basically got his base measurements and you know, then we sent a tape measure along with, I picked out a jacket and a pant that I thought would be approximately his size, just normal clothing. And then, you know, walk them through, put the tape around the chest and no, 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 a little higher, a little, you know, until like, I could see that that chest measure was my chest measurement that I wanted and, you know, get the basic measurements of him and put the jacket on. I looked at all the parts of it, like shoulders a little too big, but I knew what the jacket measured and then got the jacket back. So I basically just seeing the jacket, you know, the sleeves are too long. He stands a little forward. He's a little, he's low on the right side. You know, I could get all these corrections made. And then we made a mock-up of the suit and sent it and then put that on him.
and again did the zoom kind of fitting got it back then made the final garments and you know turned out pretty well yeah, no, yeah it looked fantastic well the film was really good <laughs> yeah i mean we were very surprised when they said that blue suit that you made for robert duvall could you make the same suit for you know for <laughs> Oh, uh, for Adam Sandler? For Adam Sandler, yes. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like, we, so we needed to get his measurements, and that was another job. But we got that off of a different suit that was made for him for that movie or bought for him. So we kind of copied the fitted suit to make the blue suit for him as well. That's so cool. Ken, um, I know whilst we were doing a bit of research for the interview, we also wanted to touch on some of the presidents. So maybe we could you know, shift gears and uh, we can get into some president territory because I know that's a huge staple of your, um, your clientele. Part of it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think it was your dad that started with Eisenhower. Like, I think he must have been, what, 22, 23 when he was he tailoring him at that point? So the Eisenhower is, you know, it's a very, a, a story dear to our hearts. You know, when my father was in concentration camp in Buchenwald, uh, so where without the American army coming there and liberating him at probably the last minute there in April of 1945. So, you know, when the American army liberated them, Eisenhower came to the camp and he actually met General Eisenhower. He was at that time like an 88 pound, one of those stick figures that you saw who had been working for over a year and first Auschwitz and then Buchenwald. Uh, and like Eisenhower was kind of like a God to my father who, you know, liberated him. And, you know, it was probably the motivation why he came to America when he was free and realized he had no more family you know, left in Czechoslovakia. So he became an American here. And like, just by luck, the owners of the factory, the, the Goldman family had to ha had a relationship with the Eisenhower family. And as soon as Eisenhower needed suits when he got out of the army, which was actually president of Columbia University first, uh, that's when my father got, you know, take special care of these clothes there for Eisenhower. And my father was like so enamored with that, he couldn't believe it. And he did take special care. And when Eisenhower got to be president, so my father was known to actually put certain notes inside his pockets he sewed when he had messages for him. And, you know, at some point the bosses called him in and said, you know, we know you've been sending notes to President Eisenhower in the suits. You've got to stop that. Uh, <laughs> but it was my father's way of being my father. Oh my God. So that was the first kind of president and other presidents we worked with through again, retail stores where they would send the order. If it was like a president Johnson, you know, would come through, through a store in Houston actually. And, you know, the first ones that he got directly involved with, I guess the secret service came to him to make bulletproof vests for, President Ford at the time, wow. because there was more of a need for that then, mm -hmm. and how to put Kevlar into a vest that he could, you know, put under his normal suit. Uh, and then, huh. again, personally, he went to the White House for Clinton, many, you know, dressed mm -hmm. Clinton through his presidency. You know, there he is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at the time that was like set up through Donna Karen, we were making her custom and ready to wear like collection clothing for men. And she had been working with Hillary. And I guess that's how they asked my father to go and help with Bill. Uh, President Obama, I got more involved with directly. Uh, so I guess he was wearing Heart Shafter Mark's clothing, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, working and living in Chicago and supporting local business there. And at some point, I think he came across a Brioni suit and realized how much nicer it was in quality and feel. And I guess the question was asked, isn't there somewhere in America that can make a suit like this? And mm. they did a little research. And I think the fashion editor of the Times 
contacted us. And next thing we know, we were at the White House, you know, beginning yeah. to measure him. So I, and we did, did, I did have the honor of going to the White House eight, eight different times during his presidency. And, you know, we more or less made all of his clothing. Yeah, I, I remember when that story came out in like 2010. I think that was the first time I'd heard of your father. And then, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was just so cool. Um, have, have you had a president, an act, a sitting president, come and visit the shop um, in Brooklyn? Not a sitting president at the time. Oh, but you have one. You have had one come in after the term. Well, well, like President Obama, we saw in New York City at his hotel after he was president, but not actually in the shop. Oh, so right. yeah, I don't think a president's ever attended here. I was just wondering what the the Secret Service had to come in and sweep in. Well, <laughs> we've had we've had mayors and heads of state, you know. Mm -hmm. So, like Mayor Bloomberg, we dress all the time, and you know, when he was mayor, he, security would come first, and yes, before he came. These are all very they well must, dressed. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, well, I mean, they must be. They must have. Um, did, do presidents have like a lot of different tailors and a lot of different brands and a lot of different suits? Because they must, they can't just have like one suit for, for well, every I, occasion. I mean, I don't know. Like, I think, you know, men are creatures of habit generally. They like what they're comfortable in. So I don't think men like yeah. to have like an assortment of all different things. I think they just, you know, want what they, you know, can possibly. You know, they just need several suits. If they find something that fits them, that looks well on them, I think that's all they really want to be wearing. They don't want to be a different actor in a different show. Mm -hmm. I mean, when President Obama one day wore the tan suit, yeah. you know, it made quite like an astronomical re reaction in the world. Oh, I'm was... oh, sorry. I, I hadn't thought you, you guys made that suit, didn't you, the tan suit? Yeah, and when he wore it like for a... <laughs> for an Easter celebration or for a mm -hmm. wedding in the summer, everybody, you know, loved it. But when he wore it at the press conference that day, people went crazy. Yeah. Everybody forgot that Reagan had worn tan suits. A lot, a lot of people have, but yeah. it may have been for a purpose because it wasn't like he couldn't have taken, you know, at that time he was going solid Navy, solid charcoal, more or less alternating suit every day. Mm -hmm. And you know, he did have like a medium gray, a subtle stripe he could have chosen to wear that was different than those two. But he jumped to, you know, what he described to me as a, a tan campaign suit, summer suit. <laughs> and what's it like actually in, in the room with the president? Is he on calls? You know, is he dealing? Is he doing some business in the background while you're measuring him? Or is he well, kind of sometimes, one -on -one you know. With you? Well, sometimes, you know, we have an appointment, but things come up and we understand when we have to wait in the red room, it's not the worst place to be. But, mm -hmm. you know, yes, sometimes there's delays as things are happening. And that's just, that's nature of the business for sure. And uh, but it's great. Like, it's a, certainly an honor. It was the first time I, I was in the White House. You know, it was a nervous situation. I mean, I just, you know, you just want to do the best you can. And I had my dad with me that day. And he was, a, you know, more of a loose cannon, I would say. So deal, keeping him, like, to behave himself and, you know, getting everything done was, you know, a little unnerving the first time. Oh, man. <laughs> um, and when you're dealing with somebody like Obama, is he picking out the fabrics personally and, and saying what he likes in the show? So the answer is yes. I mean, it's just when we met with him, you know, there would also be an aide, his aide who helped with dressing and taking care. He's usually an ex-Navy aide that always works. That's who mans the White House. And, you know, he'd be helpful too. But basically, you know, we'd start with like, what are you interested in? And he goes, well, I think I'd like a navy, a black, and a gray suit to start. And, you know, I just felt the need to ask, well, what's the black suit for? I get the gray and the navy. And, you know, he didn't really have a solid answer on that. And we thought maybe it could be a sport coat or, you know, it ended up like, you're right. I don't really need the black suit for now. Let's just do the, the gray and the navy. And then, you know, years later, like, I think I was at the White House the night before there was a party with, like, Jay-Z and, you know, 
he brought up the black suit again because by that time he had tuxedos that we had made and you know many options for almost any event but then the black suit was one we then made the black suit clearly he needed it <laughs> yeah, it's interesting i mean go back go back years of presence you had jfk and nixon doing a televised speech and nixon was wearing i think all black and jfk was wearing something a little bit easier on the eye but because he was lost in the background. Nixon was like a wash because of what he was wearing, this kind of real hmm. bad black faded suit. The the ratings for him plummeted that time. I mean, it was like also one of, I think, near enough, one of the first televised head to heads with presence back in the day. So having something that, that, that you wear, that obviously you're going to have to project some kind of confidence, but also stand out. So you can't just have like a- Right, so, so, so helping suit, right? President Obama select like, what is the Navy for a Navy suit? So I came up with the idea of this Laura Piana, uh, very fine super 170s cloth that, you know, it did emulate like the type of cloth that a Brioni was having. But, you know, we, I kind of picked out a shade of Navy that wasn't midnight, it was a little bluer. So, and it had a nice sheen to the cloth. So when, when he stands out next to other people, you know, he does shine out in that suit and it looks, you know, a little sharper, a little more interesting with a little more blue in it mm. and the finish of the fabric. So it's rare that he would stand next to someone and be like second, like he would definitely be the one shining. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And so you what uh well going back to your dad jay what is his role in the company now is he still coming in and overseeing things so, is he no still he's he's been retired for since covid began and he had really wow. slowed down a little right before that so he hasn't really been involved in the last four years at all but you know he's healthy and he's my mom is enjoying her 24 7 time with him and they have their routines but you know, he hasn't, he threatens to come in and visit, but he hasn't in a little while now. <laughs> and he, he, is in, he, he is about 94 now. Do I have that right? 94, yes. Wow. Maybe. Well, we often say on this show, like for tailors and costume designers, what's it like to tailor, I don't know, like the likes of Pierce Brosnan, where you might get starstruck. But I think for a lot of people coming into your you know your establishment it would be them no matter how high up the ladder they are in whatever film getting starstruck well, by your dad right? well i've i've found that like you know working with actors is really a pleasure because most of them you know are thrilled that a a custom suit is being made for them to play a part in something and it always enables them to be you know the character that they're going to play and you know, it takes into account their preferences and, you know, I like, I put my hand in my pocket. This is how deep it should be. Or, you know, different actors have like routines that the clothing becomes part of and, you know, working together, you can really like help them be whoever they want to be. And uh, they're always super appreciative about it. So I, I kind of, it's fun. And then it's so much fun to have it like immortalized that we can, I can go and see my clothing that I've made, you know, by just switching channels on the TV. Yeah, it's fun. pretty neat. So. And, and you do have some celebrity clients that are just buying like suits personally, right? Like I know you Taylor yeah. and Hanks and Conan O'Brien, my, my favorite host. <laughs> it's done in the past. Yes. Um, so yeah. So people are people. So whether they're acting or living, you know, they, they need clothing so once you can fit them and understand their preferences like like a james spader you know whether it's blacklist or james spader himself mm -hmm. you know it's you work with the costume designer and with him and it's it's like you're dealing with james like it's weird actors are sometimes like the costume designer is in charge of what they wear they basically you're going to wear this and look like this and you know that's what we're going to make but sometimes when the actor is the producer then he's more involved in the clothing being made for him and like it's fun with a james spader like he has like james spader clothing preferences where he's comfortable and then there's red reddington character mm -hmm. and you know, the two are not necessarily the same, but if James Spader can't wear a loud stripe, 
then Red Reddington can't either, <laughs> even <laughs> though in the character for a gangster, it might be a, a possibility to wear a gangster stripe, but, you know, the personality of the actor, you know, precludes that. Yeah, that's well, we, we have that chat all the time about Daniel Craig and Bond because we know that he has a lot of his personal preferences with, and, you know, the majority of them, I think he's knocked out of the park introducing the likes mm -hmm. of Billy Reed and, you know, Rag and Bone, the aforementioned and stuff like that. But it does sometimes, you know, where do you draw the line between the actor and, uh, and the character, right? So. I'm just thinking of one kind of clear example here. You did the um, the kind of red uh, uh, suit for Joker, right? Yep. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, that, that one. Um, I mean, it's iconic now. Uh, and this is, I assume, you have to make a lot of copies of this, right? Because getting hit. Yep. By and all kinds of yeah. Um, Whenever there's violence, there, you know, multiples are needed. Yep. Yeah. What um, and what was it like working with? Joaquin on that and with the costume designer and just so, I think it was Mark Mark Bridges was the designer. So he came to us first and you know discussed this whole idea and he said, you know, it's gonna be a three piece suit, but it's not gonna be like three matching pieces. Like the style of the jacket won't match the style of the pant or the style of the vest. And then, you know, here there was orange and red. There probably were four different shades, which through the show were intermixed and random multiples too. But, you know, all the pants were the pant, regardless of the color and the same thing with the vest and the jacket. Mm -hmm. But so he gave us an idea for like the lapel of the jacket, a peak lapel and kind of a funny shape. And as we were making the first prototype, working off like measurements we had for Joaquin at the time. Like, so we get the jacket ready and we go, and we're like, we're really rushing to get it ready. And we weren't really happy with the shape of the lapel. It didn't turn out the way we had planned it to be. So that was one thing we were saying, you know, all the dimensions, everything's right, but the lapel is a little off. So that's going to have to be like fine tuned going forward. And then he came in and we did the first fitting here. And, you know, that was quite an experience because, I don't know, maybe he, you know, he becomes the character a little bit. So that was really an experience for one on, to stare at him staring at the clothing in a mirror. Uh, but when we put it on, uh, they loved the lapel the way it came out. And that became the lapel. Like, there was no going to the one that we had planned. The one that we did, like, was perfect. Except he was, like... 30 pounds smaller than the measurements we made that first prototype of because mm -hmm. he was losing weight apparently for the part. And like every time we made the next garment, he was smaller mm -hmm. again and smaller oh, again. And God, smaller he again. was so, he was emaciated. I've just I've yeah. remembered. Yeah, so yeah. We just have yeah, each mm -hmm. time smaller, smaller, smaller until we finally got to where we needed to be. That's and I'm wondering when you make something like that, or say the costumes, you worked on the uh, Leonardo DiCaprio Great Gatsby too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, beautiful. <laughs> We'd rather make clothing like this, yes. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I never noticed that gauntlet cuff too. That's gorgeous. Um, sorry, I got distracted. Yes. But do you get many people coming to you after that, learning that you've made these suits and asking for copies or something close to it? Uh, you know, from time to time, yes. I mean, I remember this Ryan Goslin crazy, stupid love. We made mm. this, it was a green suit and some other things. And, yeah. you know, they were actually, we did a small collaboration for some small store in LA and that's where they got all the clothing from, but it all was ours. And that's what he wore. That's a great with. scene. That's when he's uh, walking Steve Carell through and just saying, we got to get that. We've been trying to cover that on the show. Ken, you see so, crazy, stupid. Oh yeah, no, I remember the yeah, yeah. So, it's so one of the, the best years, stylists. So over the years okay. we've had like, I don't know, it must be 10 or 20 people have come to us having to have us make that green suit for them in their style. <laughs> That's kind of funny. And we do get people coming in that want, you know, a Nucky style suit from the twenties or, you know, there's definitely that, that's actually from the 30s later in this in the show, but yes. Ah, uh, sure. I didn't have enough time. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> no, that's... <laughs> and is, well, was Boardwalk yeah, Empire okay. or maybe or Gatsby or uh, you worked on Wolf of Wall Street? Too. Was any of these are these all kind of comparable size productions? Is one does one stand out in your mind as being incredibly large? Well, well, 
because like you know the movie is just a one-time thing mm. whereas like boardwalk empire was like six seasons like just the pilot like we we worked for eight months on the one hour pilot mm -hmm. you know we worked directly with scorsese on that and mm. you know so many they established all the characters so it was really a ton of work mm. but but that just kept going. So, and they had research and, you know, they really, that was so accurately depicted. It was great. And I know Len, we spoke to Leonard Logsdale, who I think did some suits as well for Wolf of Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Do you kind of get on the horn to him and say, what are you up to over there? Are you doing the same style as we're doing, you know, for certain yeah, projects? No, no, I mean, this was a weird story for us because I guess the clothing, there was a credit clothing by Armani and I guess so, but Armani for some reason could only make modern Armani clothing. So they don't have the ability to make a suit that looks like a suit in the eighties. That was an Armani style. So it was a little uncomfortable, but so whether him or us, I think, you know, we would invoice the show and the show would like, somehow get the money from Armani so they could say it was clothing by Armani. <laughs> okay. Oh, That's wow. Like, like if you look, it says on the show, clothing by Armani. Yeah. But, but so, you know, so in you essence, putting... we, were, we were contracted technically by Armani to make the clothing maybe. Right, like wait, label it. But they, they were giving you patterns to work off of? Like no, no, no. We just, oh. we know the styles, but we worked with the costume designer to make what they liked, but you know, it, it was clothing by Armani. If you read the credits in the show. That's oh, like, Leonard has no luck with that, by the way. I know yeah, he, no. when he did the, when we spoke about house of Gucci with him, uh, oh, yeah. he said that he got a little bit ill and couldn't quite make it to an Al Pacino appointment. And <laughs> then you stepped in and did one suit and they got the credit right at the end of the film. Huh. Made him mad as heck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's also great, great Gatsby. They had a big contract with Brooks Brothers, right? So it was clo clothing by Brooks Brothers, and you know, so again, <laughs> they asked us to send the invoice instead of to them to Brooks Brothers, and you know, we at the time were making custom clothing for Brooks Brothers, and <laughs> they they had quite the reaction to that invoice, but they had to pay it, <laughs> <laughs> and. Some of the fabrics you used in Gatsby or even on like the Gosling suit, the Joker suit, they seem so, they really stand out, you know? Yep. Um, are these things that you just have uh, like bolts of in the factory or are these things that you have to see? Well, we, we work with all the major mills in England, Scotland, Italy. So <laughs> many of these classic fabrics still exist and are being made today. Mm -hmm. Uh was really interesting with Boardwalk Empire at the time. That's when television and things became high definition at that time. So if you looked at a fabric that someone was wearing, like at the time, the, the fashion was like year, year round <laughs> midweight fabrics. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, everything was flat. But here looking at tweeds and flannels on high definition, you could really see the weave of the cloth. And it was noticeably different. So mm -hmm. these, you know, more antique looking fabrics of that time really stood out as different. Oh, they helped establish the style. <laughs> this was fun too. Kevin Bacon there. Yep. <laughs> so that was a more recent City, one, right? City on a Hill, City yes. This we yeah, did a year uh, ago, year and a half ago. Yep. And uh, did, did you go down to the set on that one or was this another so one? So we actually doing? measured him we were on the set. We were in his apartment in New York for a fitting. We were, he was here. He's been to. He yeah, like so a real gent in your life. He's great. I think uh, we do other other shows at the time. I think he was on also Black Mass. He was in. Oh also. yeah. <laughs> we did a yeah. lot of people in that and. So that wasn't particularly great clothing. It was like mm. 70s, like either you were an FBI guy or you were a crooked politician or mm. you were a gangster. And I don't know, I think one of the costume designers themes was that, you know, everybody wore a blue blazer, whoever they were. And at some <laughs> point, but 
you know, once that, one guy that's was with having, Depp, that Yep. So yeah, once one person know. was having custom clothing, they had a, a big cast. So like, somehow everybody had to have custom clothing and then the costume designer would say you know it's custom but it can't really look custom so make it like it's an off the rack suit but then as soon as you make a suit and the person is low on one shoulder and you make it not low on that shoulder so now there's wrinkles in the back of one shoulder then you get feedback like oh the suit has wrinkles on the shoulder like they may not want custom clothing, but they do whether they know it or not. Like yeah. we worked with John Dunn, like the key was to fit the person and then they could mess up the clothing if necessary to make it look, you know, old, worn or, you know, a little more inferior. Mm. Interesting. So I'm thinking, and this is just a theory that's came to me, but you were talking about the high definition earlier. Now we can see things a lot closer up and I'm convinced now that with like the likes of Boardwalk Empire and Peaky Blinders over here in the UK, that mm -hmm. period piece clothing in, in films and, and TV shows really draw people into tailoring and get people kind of infused again about, you know, wanting to wear something very smart and something, you know, something that's going to make them look or represent a character that they like and emulate in the mm -hmm. show. And so does this kind of spring into your wheelhouse as well? Because I know you have quite a history, like you're, um, you're talking about, yep. you know, the history between the 1900s to present day. You know, this is, this is really where you come to shine, I suppose. Yeah. So, you know, we, we really, like, let's say I see a customer now, just new customer, first time comes to us. You know, typically the person says something like, oh, I need a Navy suit. So this is really no information for me at all because it's like <laughs> the first question is going to be, well, what do you need the Navy suit for? Like, when are you going to wear it and to what, or you're wearing it for work, but what is your work? Like, who are you? Like what? So until I figure out, like, it's not like, Oh, here's a Navy suit. It's like, we have no idea. So we need to get to know who the person is, who, what he's trying to look like, how he likes to dress. And then we could help him, you know, should it be conservative? Should it be a more English cloth with a more matte finish? Should it be more of an Italian cloth with a little more sheen to it? Should it be more dress up? Should, do you want to be the one that people look at when you walk in the room? Or do you want to come in and just like not stand out in the room? Or, you know, is it something where, you know, you're the star that day and you want to really shine in it? Or do you like to show off like, you know, how fitted and how, you know, built you are? Or do you like it to be like understated or, you know, there's so much to it. So, you know, we get to know the person, then we can make him, you know, it's like, what character are you? You could be any character just because just measuring your body and building a suit is like very, very simple in terms of, you know, sometimes they go just whatever you think, I don't know. But still, I could get the idea of like what he needs it for, and you know, I can probably help a lot. But it's good to know the person a little. Oh, do you get people coming in and saying, "I need a fake po pocket to put my uh, vitamin pills in," like <laughs> Bradley well, Cooper in Limitless? You do, you do, <laughs> and you know, he was, you know, he had to look presidential in that, like. <laughs> so yes, we came to the right well, place. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well. Jay, I mean, it's been a real pleasure for myself. I know Ken was uh, talking about you guys way before I, I managed to get sure. you online. So thanks so much for taking time out to speak to us. Absolutely, um, I should, pleasure. I should mention also, just in passing, the book, oh. uh, Measure of a Man, your father's book, From Auschwitz Survivor to President's Taylor, yep. um, is available on Amazon, I'm sure, other decent bookshops as well. It's, yep. I have actually just ordered it before we got on the line, so that will be my next uh, next reading book. Say it's a very inspirational story. Okay. So it starts off a little rough, it ends pretty well, but you know, it's like it's a nice. It's not so, you know, it's the view of a very tough time in in the world through a fifteen year old's eyes, and uh, you know, his impression of what he went through. Yeah. And, no, you know, his mission good. that led him here and always it's about living and overcoming adversity and, you know, like we're the last surviving, you know, union men's clothing factory in New York City. Mm -hmm. So it's the same kind of odds as similar odds.
Jay, I feel weird asking you about your father. I feel like I'm. <clears throat> yep. I feel like I'm treating it like Frank Sinatra Jr. You know? No, like, no absolutely but, not. Um, but uh, I, I am curious because I've heard your um, your father in interviews talk about how mm -hmm. wonderful it is that you and your brother have continued on the legacy yep. and um, you know continue to run the shop. Do, do you have plans to to keep the legacy going with? Uh, well, we haven't we haven't made a formal announcement yet, but my son joined the company about three months ago. So, oh, uh, so David Greenfield is working with us and uh, we need the energy and the youth and to bring ourselves back more into the modern age more. So, you know, I changed the company a lot when, with my entry and, you know, kind of tailored it to what I like to do and the business going in that direction. But, you know, now my son will have the flexibility to do the same. What could he possibly do? 3D scanning and virtual? Well, well, <laughs> Probably that stuff I've had a lot of experience with and it has its limitations, but yeah. you know, it's a social media and it's just like, you know, most people still don't know who we are or that it's available to come up here and have a suit made. Hmm. So there's a, there's a challenge in that. So we don't and want to take over the world. We just want one customer at a time. Yeah. Honestly, you, should, you mentioned yep. a lot of like projects too, that you guys have worked on. It's basically a film and television that yes. I didn't know you guys have played any role in. And it's fascinating. I feel like, I feel like there's a lot of untold stuff there. That... Yeah. I mean, we're certainly like, you know, we have the ability to, you know, be of help, like, you know, Nucky's cuff. Like I, I know all the clothing possibilities. So it's like, how can we make him a little more special? Mm. Uh, you know, so the suggestions and, you know, if you understand, you know, the storyline and what you're doing and the history of the clothing, you know, you could help. So, you know, the character should be appropriate for what he's trying to be. Awesome. Well, Jay, we're going to let you go. I think we've had you on the blow for Thanks. about an hour. Your voice must be getting croaked, but just a little bit. head out. <laughs> Greenfield Suits on Instagram. Uh, it's a place to hang yep. out. Also, some great behind the scenes shots of people cutting the suits and you know, the, the bolts and your dad, of course. Yeah, we have this. Films. You know, we have this hundred year old clothing factory here that's been in operation steadily. And uh, other than having to be shut down for COVID, for a week until we figured out how to make masks and hospital gowns and brought our people in to make a, find a way to do something useful. Uh, other than that, a hundred years of making clothing in this building. Wow. Well, like I'm very, very proud of that. And uh, Ken will be down there tomorrow morning. From so <laughs> <laughs> any time. This, this was all the foreplay for Ken to come down. By the way, and see. You sure. Guys, so. I'm hoping we still have a tan fabric used for Obama. I, I'd yep. actually forget that. Too. I do know what that is. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm not even kidding. I actually know how I want it. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, yep. greenfieldclothiers.com is also the place people can shop sure. right in town. But um, yep. Ken, thanks for stopping on. Uh, Oceanographer, as always, and Jay. Uh, been a pleasure, and uh, hope to have Thanks. you on again soon. Glad to be here. Take care. Yeah. Thanks, gents. Take care. Thank you.